Okay, so this is the, we're in the judgment um, of the nations or judgment to the nations before we go into uh, early next week, the judgment to the world. These are the nations that we are um, going to be, he, which Isaiah addresses. Um, they should all sound reasonably familiar. Some of them are ancient nations that don't, uh, uh, you know, exist anymore like Assyria or Moab. Some of them uh, are, you know, ripped out of the headlines from today like Sudan or mm -hmm. Jerusalem. The, here's a quick map. It's from that sheet that I sent the PDF out of. And so you can see some of the nations that um, we are referring to. There's Egypt down there at uh, the bottom. You see Edom, Ammon, um, the purple bit, the purple at the top with Damascus, that's Assyria after the conquest of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And you see Philistia in the green off to the left. So some of the nations that prophecies were issued to are there sort of right around the immediate neighbors of Judah. They touch mm -hmm. Judah's borders. Some of them do not do not fit on the map. Babel is not on this map. Um, uh, there's another one. I think it's um, Aram is way off the map above Damascus. So mm -hmm. some of them are nearby neighbors. Some of them are not. These prophecies are not to the other nations, at least not in the same way that the first 12 chapters are prophecies to Judah. These prophecies are about these other nations, but Isaiah is not going to those nations and giving them the content of the prophecy. Um, and so they, they, they aren't privy to what Isaiah is saying, unlike the first 12 chapters of Isaiah, which were prophecies about Judah and Isaiah went to the king of Judah and issued them. Um, so what, uh, I'll stop talking here. Um, what do you think prophecies to other nations, what, what, what would the purpose, what would the point of that be? Any thoughts? Basically, it's a warning them that they are doing evil things and that evil is going to lead to their downfall. Okay. Yeah. Why, and that, why, why would Judah need to know that? Because Judah is going to be sort of rewarded for, in the end, they, they're going to go through some hard, hard times, but then they're going to get some good rewards at the end. Yeah. Well, now, how about don't take it personally. You're not alone. You're going to get, these other nations are going to get it too. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you're going to do very well. They're not going to do so well. <laughs> right. In time. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Sort of down the road some yeah. bits of years. <laughs> the few. So uh, I would also say that, remember, um, 1 through 12, one of the themes in the early, those early chapters was Isaiah warning uh, Judah off of playing alliances and political games. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why th this, these prophecies would be helpful to Judah is because they, they should not rely on those other nations too much because they will eventually crumble. They're, they're not a, you know, firm rock to hold on to. Uh, they're they're going to go away as well. They also, I think, show that God, uh, Israel's God, Yahweh, isn't just tunnel visioned in on Judah and Israel, but is concerned about the rest of the world too. The... One of the things I think we sometimes forget about ancient religions, I mean, most of us probably know that every other nation at this time 
in the eighth, seventh, sixth centuries were all polytheistic. They all believed in other gods. We probably get that. One of the things that we sometimes can forget is that uh, polytheism saw its gods as territorial. They, they didn't do what we do. Uh, what, what we do is, you know, we say, I'm a Christian. I'm not these other things. I believe in this religion and I don't believe in those religions. They didn't do that with religion. They didn't say our gods exist, but your gods don't. That wasn't how polytheism worked. What they said was our gods function here and your gods function there. If, uh, if you were lucky enough to conquer another nation, you would go in and you would set up temples to your gods as a way of expanding their territory. And one of the things you were doing when you were defending your city or your nation was you were defending your homeland, but you were also defending the land of your gods and sort of pr protecting their honor. Because if, the, the, mm -hmm. if you lost, they were going to lose ground. Um, Israel's religion, Judah's religion, is 180 degrees in the other direction. Not only is it not polytheistic, it doesn't believe in other gods. It also doesn't believe that Israel's God is only in their land. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and it's, it's one of the messages that, uh, and we're going to, as we go through, particularly through the 40s, uh, it's one of the constant messages, mm -hmm. I am the Lord. Those other gods don't exist. The whole earth is mine. Um, it, it's not, this isn't just a little regional uh, farm team religion. This is uh, God of the whole earth. So by showing the prophecies, by speaking about the nations that are directly around them, and then the nations that are even a bit further out from that, what it's telling the people in Judah is that God has his finger on the pulse of what's going on there too. Um, our God isn't just a small farm team God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. you know, one, Father Rick, just quickly, one thing that it does interesting was that the it wasn't just military defeat that was going to happen to those other nations, but it was also going to be ecological disaster which of course God could do, but you know, the other gods couldn't do. So they'd have terrible droughts, there'd be terrible floods, they'd have no grain, they'd have no harvests, you know, things that you, know, you just couldn't do with a normal military operation. Sure. That would yeah. take hours beyond that. And those other nations were praying to their gods for good weather, for mm -hmm. rain, for crops to grow. And as we get, as you see the prophecies here, it's not their gods who have any agency whatsoever over the weather mm -hmm. or the ecology. It's, it's Yahweh God. Mm -hmm. One of the themes that pops up and we'll, we'll do this kind of uh, quickly is the day of the Lord. This is not uh, only in the book of Isaiah, we see this as a theme uh, throughout the Old and the New Testaments, although the focus is a little different once we get to the New Testament. Um, every year on um, Ash Wednesday, we, we read the great um, warning of the day of the Lord from the book of Amos. And uh, there were other prophets that talked about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord was certainly a day of destruction and a day of judgment, which I, my guess is no one has fuzzy feelings about judgment. You know, if I, if I said, we're going to have judgment Sunday at St. Mark's, my, my guess is no one would be super excited about that. Um, as, as we are about food trucks coming on Sunday. That's more exciting than the day of judgment. <laughs> but the, if judgment was not always a bad thing uh, and was not always seen as a bad thing. So if something horrible happened to you and uh, your case was being pleaded in front of a judge 
and the judge was going to rule in your favor and right whatever wrong had been committed against you, that would be a day of judgment. But if it's in your favor, it's not going to be something that you're going to fear or worry about. In fact, you're going to look forward to it. You're, you're going to look forward to the day of sentencing or restitution. It, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a good day. And so that's how the day of the Lord as a day of judgment went, that God would right all wrongs. And so if you and your nation was not in the wrong, and you and your nation actually had been wronged by other nations, then the day of the judgment was something that you, the day of the Lord was something that you prayed for, you wanted, because you wanted, you, we always want things to be made right. This is something that John Golding Gay uh, says uh, about um, prophecy in the day of the Lord. He says, a pattern characteristic of prophecy appears here in this section of Isaiah. It speaks as if the end of the world is imminent. What fulfills such prophecies is not the actual end, but a particular historical expression of God's ultimate purpose, receiving fulfillment in time. Um, that's, a, that's a wordy way of saying uh, in the, particularly the Old Testament, there were several days of the Lord that were called for. Um, it wasn't that each one was meant to be the day. It was a day of the Lord where one major step of God's plan would be fulfilled and this nation would receive judgment. And then maybe a hundred years later, there would be the day of the Lord when another nation would receive judgment or um, something would befall the world that would reveal the, the further end of God's plan. So here, here here's some text. Uh, and this is uh, part of the, uh, the prophecy of Babylon. He says there, Yahweh's day is coming, ruthless with fury and angry blazing to turn the earth into a desolation so it can annihilate the wrongdoers from it because the stars in the heavens and their constellations will not flash their light. The sun will have gone dark when it comes out. The moon will not shine its light. Um, because, okay, before I go to chapter 14, um, any thoughts on this? We, we, we see the ecological um, uh, ramifications that Jeff was talking about. The, the sun's going dark. Marduk, the chief god of Babylon, is not going to be able to do anything about the sun because Marduk doesn't exist and has no agency over the sun, but, but God will do something. This is a prophecy which uh, eventually happens. The, the prophecy against Babylon comes to fruition for Babylon is destroyed um, by the Persians. There is a day of the Lord. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Because Yahweh will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel, he will settle them down on their land and the alien will join them and attach themselves to Jacob's household. So here we see the judgment that is levied against Babylon is a, it's a day of the Lord. It's a day of judgment for Babylon, but not for Israel, not for Judah. God's going to have compassion on them. They're, they're going to come back to their land um, and, and things will be made right. This is another part of the prophecy, which happens um, when Persia destroys Babylon, Persia allows the children of Judah to return home and they, they do settle in the land. So we get a, a little glimpse into the why of the Babylon uh, prophecy. It's interesting here, particularly at the beginning of the prophecies uh, of the nations, 
because in the eighth century, um, you know, when uh, Isaiah is speaking to King Ahaz, Babylon is not a major figure on the world stage at all. It's basically a city. It's uh, in um, modern day Iraq. Um, you know, it's a city like Jerusalem or Damascus or any other city, uh, but, it's, but it's not a nation. It is certainly not a, uh, a superpower. Um, when, when the book of Isaiah was arranged in its current form, this prophecy might have been seen as one of great importance for those living later. They would have looked back and said, oh, you, you know, this, this happened and then um, this happened. The prominence of Babylon here, uh, when set apart, for, uh, set next to the uh, invisibility of Assyria. Assyria isn't even mentioned. It's kind of strange because Assyria is the superpower in the 8th, 8th century. So one of the things we think is that while obviously a uh, prophecy against a specific nation and that will eventually become a superpower and that we will eventually fall, there is a a procession, a line of superpowers in the ancient world where one comes after the other. There's the um, uh, Assyria is the largest empire in the world at, at its zenith. Then it's destroyed by the Babylonians. The Babylonians are destroyed by the Persians. The Persians are handled by the Greeks. The Greeks are subsumed by um, Rome. And so in another sense, a prophecy against Babylon could also stand in for a prophecy against any other future superpower in Israel's history. Can any of you think of another book of the Bible where Babylon does stand in for other superpowers? Are you all still there? Yeah. <laughs> So the book of Revelation, uh, it mentions Babylon uh, over and over and over again. Uh, there's the, you know, um, God says to the people of Babylon, come out of her, come out of her, my people. There's the great figure who's known as the whore of Babylon. Babylon, when John is writing the book of Revelation, uh, was no longer a threat to anybody. Uh, he's, he's writing 700 years after the fall of Babylon. No, no one cared about Babylon. Babylon was gone. But Babylon in the book of Revelation is a stand-in figure for what was the current superpower that was aligned against the will of God, and that was the Roman Empire. When, whenever you see, I mean, there are many things in the book of Revelation that aren't one-to-one -one where you can't just say, well, this means that and that means this. But when, when you see Babylon, you can almost always do a one-to-one. -one. What he's actually talking about is Rome. And so that, that idea may also be here in uh, the book of Isaiah. Okay. Isaiah 17. And uh, this is part of the, against uh, Damascus. Hey, I, I love this translation. Hey, the horde of many peoples that roar like the seas roar, the din of nations that make a din like the din of mighty water. Nations make a din like the din of much water, but he reprimands it. And it flees far away, driven like the chaff on the mountains before the wind, like a tumbleweed before a storm. This is the share of the people who despoil us, the lot of the people who plunder us. What, what do you see going on here? Are there any themes that you recognize from other parts of the Bible, from Isaiah? Certainly retribution. Okay. Got, we got enough of that in Isaiah. 
I mean, he's talking metaphorically about water. We've, we've done uh, water as a metaphor uh, last week where the, the floodwaters were going to come up to Judah's neck, but no further. You might remember that. Um, here, uh, God is uh, pushing the waters around and says, you know, he brings it here, and then he reprimands it and it flees away. That's a major theme in the Bible of God being able to control the waters. We see it in uh, the book of Genesis where he creates waters and then separates them and moves them around in the, I mean, forget the ancient world in the modern world is, uh, you know, are there any powers that we uh, come into contact with that are as powerful as water? We saw that a few weeks ago with the floods um, in our, our area, knocking homes off its foundations, uh, right? Like water is powerful. And one of the themes of the Bible was, yes, water is powerful, but God can um, control it. I think part of what this piece is saying is that every power, every earthly power that is opposed to God's will will be um, knocked off its throne, particularly at the, this last bit. This is the share of the people who despoil us, the lot of the people who plunder us. So we might be despoiled, we might be plundered, we might be thrown down by some other nation. And this one, we're, we're talking about Damascus. But anyone who thwarts God's plans in dealing with Judah um, will eventually fall away and run into trouble. So it was a little bit of hope, again, for people who, were, um, who would have been struggling. There's an interesting conflict here as well. A conflict, uh, but uh, maybe portrait to it as well, where... There's, there's this wetness associated with with it, with the the din of the water and the cleansing effect of the water. But there's also tumbleweed is not normally associated with water. It's exactly the opposite. You know, it's like a dryness and, a, and sort the of this sense of wind and yeah, which is a different force. Right, and you're exactly right. So God's going to use the wetness and God's going to use the dryness mm -hmm. against the nations. And that that is a theme that shows up again and again in Isaiah. We'll see um, the, the desert becomes uh, air, um, uh, a place where water is and the place where water is becomes arable land. Like um, God, uh, one of the themes is that God moves stuff around. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> nice pickup, Jerry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah 13, here am I stirring up Madei um, who are the Persians against them who don't think about mm -hmm. silver, gold, they don't want it, but their bows will smash the young. Um, it, what he's saying about the Persians are that they are ruthless. They don't care about how much money they're going to get from you. They just want to um, kill people. Mm. So Babel the most splendid of kingdoms, the majestic glory of the Babylonians will become like God's overturning of Sodom and Gomorrah. So here Isaiah is, he's already, you know, he's foretold that, that Babylon is going to fall. He also talks about God um, using the Persians to take down Babylon huge theme uh and and kind of interesting mm -hmm. if you remember that that long string of um superpowers assyrians mm -hmm. babylonians persians uh, greeks mm -hmm. uh, romans the, one of the themes in isaiah and the rest of the scriptures is that god uses the an emerging superpower to take out the current superpower and then that that new superpower is taken out by the next one and that God uses them as a tool. You may remember kind of famously that the king of the Persians was King Cyrus, and he is called in the Old Testament in one place. Uh, the, the word Messiah is used of him. Uh, mm -hmm. as He was God's instrument of salvation for the people of Jerusalem because he 
destroyed the Babylonians and allowed uh, them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So God can even use the other nations and other nations we don't even like. God can use them as, um, as tools. Um, on that day, uh, this, and this is, this is kind of interesting. It, in, we, we had 12 chapters of prophecies of and against Judah. We, we've heard, you know, Judah is going to be overthrown uh, uh, multiple times in chapters one through 12. But in this section of the prophecies to the nations or against the nations, Jerusalem is reprised. Jerusalem is prophesied against too. On that day, Jacob's splendor will become poor. The beefiness of his body will become thin. It will be like the gathering of the standing harvest when someone harvests the ears in his arm. Um, and so while the prophecies to all the other nations, one of the reasons might be is to not uh, lean on those other nations too much. Uh, by putting them here, Judah can't always think that it's better than those other nations. They also will, um, are going to receive judgment. And we've seen why uh, in the previous chapters, Ahaz doesn't listen to God and um, all of their poor treatment of those who are vulnerable in their land. Okay. This is sort of a, 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 bit, a little bit of a long section. This is a um, part of the prophecy against Egypt. Misraim is Egypt. On that day, Egypt, sorry, ladies, this is terrible. Uh, on, <laughs> on that day, Egypt will be like women and will be trembling and dread before the shaking of the hand of Yahweh of armies, which he is shaking against it. Yahweh will cause himself to be acknowledged by the Egyptians and the Egyptians will acknowledge God on that day. They will serve with sacrifice and offering and make pledges to Yahweh and make good on them. What is God, what is Isaiah saying here? What's, what, what's God saying here? What's happening? They will repent. <laughs> well, God will become, he will become their God. Egypt's God. Well, they will see, not necessarily repent, but they'll see the, um, maybe Steve, see the, see the light that they don't now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in one section, I don't think I um, include it here, but uh, it said that there will be an altar to Yahweh that will be established in Egypt um, and that, uh, you know, the, the Egyptians will basically take on the Israelite religion. Um, this um, doesn't happen in the ancient world. Um, Egypt eventually takes over Judah briefly, and then Egypt is destroyed by the Assyrians and, the, and Assyria takes over Egypt. Um, but there, there's no discernible part of history where we see this um, uh, occurring unless they're talking about uh, modern days uh, where, of course, there, um, there are uh, Jewish synagogues and Christian churches uh, in Egypt. But I, I can't imagine that's what um, Isaiah was talking about. There's, here's the next part of mm -hmm. the um, prophecy to mm -hmm. Egypt. Um, so Misraim is Egypt and Ashur is Assyria. 
Yahweh will strike Egypt, striking, but healing. And they will turn back to Yahweh and he will let himself be entreated by them and will heal them. On that day, there will be a causeway from Egypt to Assyria. Assyria will come to Egypt and Egypt to Assyria. Egypt will serve with Assyria. On that day, Israel will be the third for Israel, for Egypt, and for Assyria. A blessing in the middle of the earth because Yahweh of armies has blessed it, saying, Blessed be my people, Egypt, my handiwork, Assyria, and my domain, Israel. Um, uh, one of the things I see in this is that, I mean, I mean throughout the Old Testament, Egypt, 99% of the time when Egypt is mentioned, it's the enemy. And it's, it's sort of the primordial enemy of Egypt as the ones who enslaved it and had to be, you know, defeated through um, plague and pestilence. And here, God is saying that, you know, he's going to strike back, but he's also willing to heal them. He's also, if they turn back to him, then even they, the primordial enemy, can be received. And the, this next piece is, is kind of stunning. Blessed be my people, Egypt, my handiwork, Assyria, and my domain, Israel. God saying, God calling Israel his domain isn't surprising at all. God's saying that the Egyptians are his people and that the Assyrians are his handiwork. Mm -hmm. what, what are the ramifications of this? Hmm. Is it sort of talking about bringing together all of the people in between? Like, Because Egypt is on the lower end of that map and Assyria is up on the upper end of that map and Israel's right between. So if one goes to the other and the other comes back, there's no more fighting. Yeah. It's, it's sort no of like bad guy. It, it, it's the geopolitical equal to, and the lion shall lie down with the lamb. Mm -hmm. But Israel still has Jerusalem, which is kind of still the, the central focus of the worship. Um. Yeah, um, but 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 here, you know, in this section right here, Jerusalem isn't the the focal point. It's it's God is calling other nations mm -hmm. His people, right? Which it, it, it's one of the reasons I think I think I do this right. Yes, okay, here we go. And this is um, basically um, the end of my bit for tonight. This is part of the reason I think Isaiah is referred to over and over again as the fifth gospel, because um, the, you know, the, the first 11 chapters of the Bible of Genesis are about God creating the whole earth, and then there's a flood over the whole earth and there's the tower of Babel and they go out over the whole earth with their languages. But then by the 12th chapter, we then we're talking about Abraham and Abraham's family. And then it's Isaac and Isaac's family. And, uh, and then it's Jacob and Jacob's family and Jacob, his name becomes Israel. And he has 12 sons who become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel by the 12th chapter where we, we narrow the focus on just one family and one nation. And that's basically the focus for the rest of the Bible up to Isaiah, where Isaiah then opens the shutter again and says, yes, uh, this is God's people. This is God's nation. But the plan is for the, all of the nations 
to come together. God does not just love us, these people. God loves all people. Egypt, the primordial uh, bad guy, they're my people. Assyria, the people we're trying to keep from destroying us, they're my people. Um, the, the next place we see the, the, the frame open up like this is in the ministry of Jesus, where he starts, uh, we start talking about Jesus, not just saving one people, one nation, but coming to save all people in all nations. Um, and, and so I, I, I totally get that this is a very difficult part mm -hmm. of Isaiah, but if you get one little kernel of beauty out of this section, mm -hmm. I, I hope this, that God's focus is not narrow, but God has um, a, a, uh, a wide aperture, which takes in the whole earth, which again, pushes against the polytheism of its time, which says that my God's here and your God's there and their God's over there. No, uh, the, the idea is that we are mm -hmm. all children of, of one father mm -hmm. and God calls all people, his people. And uh, Jesus's great commission, right? He said, therefore the go and make disciples of all nations in Matthew nations. 28. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. Yeah. And, you know, the, there is a slight subcurrent uh, in, in the New Testament. It gets picked up nicely in the, the TV series, the, the, the Chosen, that when Jesus starts going out to other people other than Jews living in and around Jerusalem and Judea, they, they, they get really huffy. Like, why do you have to go out there to them? You're our Messiah. Like, and Jesus constantly pushed against that because he's not just their messiah he's our messiah and for for those of us who aren't jewish who don't have jewish lineage that's really good news that mm -hmm. um, that and perhaps, uh, we, he re and perhaps he realized that the jews would reject him too i mean to for to a large extent they rejected christ right mm -hmm. right and it had to go out to the nations to survive mm -hmm. The Gentiles and... and and I would say it's a return to that early. So, so much of the of the scriptures are about the the return to Eden, you know, go, going uh, mm -hmm. e even the the Book of Revelation at the end. The, all the imagery is from Eden, where we're returning to God's original design for the universe, uh, the cosmos, and um, the earth. And um, that, that original, I mean, the first image is God creating the earth, not just um, the Holy Land. Right. And so it's, it's, it's a hearkening back mm -hmm. and a pushing forward. Mm -hmm. Before I end this slideshow, um, next week, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, uh, we're going to do 24, 25, and 20. Uh, six, which will get us through the judgment to the nations. That'll be kind of quick. And I'm, I'm going to try and push through uh, chapter 39.